As, as you know, we're, we're going to be talking about signs of the times and what the scripture tells us about uh, these days in which we're living in and, uh, and what is to come as well. The Bible talks about these things. And um, today we're, um, today's going to be got, like laying the foundation because there's a lot to, to talk about. Uh, but today I, I want to just kind of lay a foundation and we're going to go over a few things, for example, uh, the relevance of this topic, because, uh, you, you know, you get some people that um, when it comes to Bible prophecy and end time events or uh, things like this, they say, oh, what comes comes. We just go and we do what we need to do and preach the gospel. And while that's 100 percent, you know, we all want to we, we don't stop um everything because, ah, you know, I see some Bible prophecies being fulfilled and now all of a sudden I'm going to go hide in a cave. That's that's not the idea. <laughs> in fact, everything that we learn from Scripture should motivate us to uh, do more, not less. So, you know, this this whole topic of that we're going to be studying at, it's it's not to, you know, to 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 detract in any way from our main uh, mission that Jesus gave us, which is the great com the great commission. To, to go into all the world, to, to reach out with the good news that, that Jesus gave us. And this is just part of being informed. You know, Jesus uh, put things in Scripture. God put things in Scripture for a reason. And you have the whole book of Revelation. You have, you know, one third of the Bible, which is about a dream or a vision or, a, you know, and so God speaks in various ways and, and he, he loves to put to to let us know what's going on in the world through uh, putting it right there in scripture and so there is a great relevance uh, to this so we're going to talk about the relevance and we're going to talk about the fact that jesus expects us um, to discern the signs of the times and the seasons in which we're living this is not just like a you know kind of an optional you know, unnecessary thing. I mean, Jesus talked about this in Matthew 24, and he took the time to to spell out to his disciples, you know, what would be um, the what would be happening in the time just before his coming, and and things that would be going on. And so, if Jesus took the time <clears throat> to uh, to to explain these things, then our part is to to understand. So. Uh, Jesus talked about these things and he has an expectation uh, to, uh, he specifically says, and we'll look at the scripture that says, I want you to understand the season in which you're living. So we're going to look at uh, a few, a uh, couple of prophecies that uh, from Daniel that specifically uh, talk about and identify this time in which we're li living and as being part of the times of the end. And there's a couple very specific things that he said that he prophesied it would be like, and it's only been fulfilled in this generation. So there's a lot of signs of the times. Matthew 24, the whole book, there's lots of scripture. But today we're just going to, as I mentioned, kind of lay the foundation. And uh, and and this will be a series. You know, we're not going to cover everything, uh, only just today. We are also going to talk about uh, the scripture that is quite popular and known out there, how Jesus comes as a thief in the night in regards to his return. We're going to look at the context of who he's talking to there, and we're going to to see, some of you may be surprised, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at the scriptures uh, in relation to that as well. Okay, so first off, uh, just about the relevance of this topic. You know, I've been a missionary for... Um, 30 years, about 30 years now. And <clears throat> one of, let me see, I'm trying to remember where this happened. My first stop was in Romania, where I was for about eight years. Okay, this was in Poland. Um, we were doing some uh, street shows, uh, evangelistic type of witnessing on the streets with music and a bit of theater and just street plays, basically. And uh, we, I remember we were on the walking street in uh, a city called, uh, where was that? I think that was, it doesn't matter. I think it was uh, Gdansk or Sopot or one of those. Anyway, and a uh, nice place near the sea and, and all of that. Uh, so we were doing some street plays and, and things and witnessing to people. And I remember there was this one long-haired, uh, dressed in black rocker 
you know, with the uh, spikes and his leather jacket and <laughs> and all of this, uh, he 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 was touched by the the street plays we were doing, and and he he received Jesus, and he. But, but, you know, he was not from a church background or anything like that, obviously. And he was, uh, so it was kind of a new thing for him, new experience. And I remember I was, um, you know, helping disciple him and, and you know, just taking him through scripture and laying a foundation uh, of his new life in Jesus. Uh, but we also, we, we looked at some of these Bible prophecies that are very specific and things that Jesus said uh, would be happening and, and all of this. And um, after we went through some of these studies, he said to me, you know, now he believes that the Bible truly is the word of God because he sees in these prophecies because so many were fulfilled already and, he, and uh, predicted, you know, long before uh, their fulfillment. And he could see that. And so he, he just in studying these scriptures, he could, to him, it was a, a wake up call that the Bible is really inspired by God it, and it's not just another book. And so it, it caused him to believe in the the relevance of the, the Bible and the scriptures. And it for him, it, it really made a, a big impact in, in opening him up to the rest of what the Bible has to say about anything else. So, you know, when we talk about the relevance of Bible prophecy, it's it's uh, it's relevant. It's Bible, you know, and and it's and it's. Uh, you know, so I, I just remembered that that circumstance, and it was uh, so for him. It was very relevant as well. And again, you know, it's it's in the Bible. So when we talk about end times and we talk about Bible prophecy, you know, the fact that God put it in the Bible should be enough to say that it's important that we understand. I don't think God uh, wastes uh, space <laughs> in in the Bible and what He inspired people to write and to put to put in there uh, for no reason. So. So again, it is relevant, and the Bible is full of prophecy, prophesying things about the coming of Jesus, about the rise and fall of empires. And so God took the time to share a lot of things before they happen because he wants his people to be informed. Amos 3, 7, a scripture I quoted earlier, says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret." Whoops, I am frozen. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for letting me know I'm frozen. How long was I frozen there? Okay, doesn't matter. All right, let's 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 do with this camera here. All right. So let's see here. So Amos 3, 7. It says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. Okay, so God takes the time to... Uh, to let us know what's happening. So it's our job to understand what's happening. He wants us to know what's happening so we're not just totally caught off guard and unaware. <clears throat> God is preparing his bride, okay? That is a theme. It's a culmination of what God is working towards. And Jesus always, uh, he, 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 he came to prepare a bride for himself. And, and those who love him, are being prepared in that way. And, and, and Jesus does not want to leave his bride out in the cold as far as what's going on in the world and what's happening. And so, <clears throat> you know, he, that's, that's why he takes the time to, to put these things in scripture so that we can understand what's going on. All right. So every part of scripture we know is to pattern our life uh, after the scripture. So for example, if we know certain things are coming, then it should affect our life in some way, whether it's a physical preparation or spiritually, we're you know, double checking if we're where we need to be. You know, right now in the world, things are happening um, in such a way that God is, is also using this time as a, to shake whatever can be shaken. People are evaluating, many people are evaluating their life and the way they, they have been doing things. And, you know, it's a time to really see if we're where we need to be. It's like a, uh, um, how, do, how to say, like a um, check post. And no, that's not the word. Uh, it's a, a landmark kind of time. You know, when you get to these markings on the road, you know you've reached a certain uh, part of the, the, your journey and, and all of this. So it's, it's like a, it's, it's a point where people are doing that and they're just uh, taking stock of their life and really seeing 
okay, am I where I need to be and, and what's, what's going on in the world? So it's important. In Daniel, it says those who know their God will be strong and rise up and, and instruct many um, because a lot of people, especially as time goes on more and more, won't know what's going on when things begin to unfold that, that we've always, that it's always been there in scripture. But then when you start seeing things happening, you know, a lot of people, some, many will be caught off guard and all of this. And so God needs his people. He, he expects that his, his kids, his people, his bride, his children will, will know what's going on and will be able to, to help other people know what's going on. And so that we can navigate this time, uh, which is, which is coming. So, for example, in Scripture, if you knew a famine was coming, would you prepare? <laughs> Joseph with Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh had the dream and, and um, you know, so and then uh, Joseph was able to prepare the the all of Egypt and, and basically save uh, the Jewish people as well as well as a lot of others by preparing for the famine that was coming. So, you know, is that important? Was it important to know that a famine was coming? Is it important to know? Uh, in Acts eleven twenty eight, 28, Agabus said again, you know, there were, hey, there's a famine that's going to be coming and the, the church uh, there, they, they were making preparations for that. What if you knew that the Bible says that there will come a time that you can't buy or sell? without this particular, what's referred to as the mark of the beast and, and all of that, would you, how would you prepare for that? Do you prepare for that at all? Do you ever think about the fact that, just imagine, you know, because we read it on a, it's in the Bible, okay, but most people think, uh, you know, far, far away in the distance, uh, never really think about it very much. Can you think of the reality of living in that circumstance where maybe they say one day, look, you can't, uh, you know, go into these places unless you have this vaccine or you unless you have this mark that shows you've been vaccinated and all of this and we're not going to let you mingle and you know or just uh, these these talks are being had right now at high levels you can go and do your research there where they are talking about you know how to you know is it safe for people to come out well maybe first we need to vaccinate everybody and then we need a system that monitors if you've been vaccinated so you know, we know that you are safe to come around i'm not saying all that's going to happen right now but um, what i am saying is that these talks are being uh held right now at, at extremely high levels and there is groundwork going on being prepared right now for these times in which we're living and yeah you know, i'm not going to go too deep into you know um, that right now. But uh, I will say that this is a time when many things are happening behind the scenes as well. And But God also wants to use this time, to, like I said, to really uh, help us take stock of our life, see where we're at, and uh, to make sure that we are on track with the mission and the purpose that he has for us as well. <clears throat> okay, so um, in 1 Thessalonians 5.20, it also talks about do not despise Prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil, and may the God of peace sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're not to despise prophecies, but we are to test all things. Well, the greatest way to test is to actually weigh it with Scripture, balance Scripture with Scripture, and see what the rest of, of the Word of God has to say about that. The Word of God, the Bible is the best explanation for itself, and we just need to view it in context. And so we're supposed to test things because there's a lot of <laughs> craziness out there and even you know people saying all kinds of things. So we need to be grounded in Scripture. We need to look in the Word of God Turn on some light there. We need to look in the word of God for our answers, not the latest, you know, fringe thing somebody's talking about over there. It may or may not be true, but balance it with scripture. You know, the scripture is our foundation. The Bible is our anchor, is our, is our foundation to build everything else, you know. And so we need to know what the scripture says. And that's the point of all of this that we're going to be looking at. We're, we're going to allow the scripture to be our foundation to, to understand uh, the rest. All right. So also 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we are to be diligent and study 
to show ourselves to prove to God, rightly handling the word of truth. Some people, they'll take a scripture and, and say, it means this and it means that. And, it, and it's just, there's, there's no other scriptural precedent for that. And, you know, I'm not saying God cannot reveal things that aren't uh, in Scripture. But what I am saying is that the Scripture itself is the best interpreter as a first foundational uh, understanding. So we need to study to show ourselves approved to God so that we can rightly handle the Scripture, the Word of God, and not just repeat stuff that, you know, isn't accurate. All right, so let's talk about what did Jesus say about recognizing uh, some of these end times, uh, it's referred to, as, as it's referred to in Scripture here. Uh, let's, I'm going to read from Matthew 24, uh, starting at verse 32. All right, Matthew 24, verse 32. Now, he says here, From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, this is Matthew 24, verse 32. Uh, we'll go through you know, some of Matthew 24, uh, at a, a next uh, later stage. But right now I wanted to jump right to this just to show that Jesus does expect us to discern the season we are in. Because right here it says, learn the lesson from the fig tree. When it starts looking like it's, a, you know, putting out its leaves and all this, you know, summer is near. Okay. And this whole Matthew chapter 24, it started off with the disciples asking what will be you know, happening before happening before the return before Jesus returns again, and and all of this, and Jesus lists a, a bunch of things, and then so he finishes up finishes it up with this. So he said, "Learn the lesson from the fig tree. When you see these things, you know summer is near. And so also when you see all these things, all the things Jesus spoke about in Matthew twenty four, you can you know go and and read all of those things. We're not going to read the whole chapter." or right now. I'll, so, but if you go through and you read there, you know, it talks about pestilences, you know, and now we have the coronavirus going around and it's not just like an isolated thing, but it's like traveled the globe because we're all connected now through, through uh, the world is much smaller than it was a hundred years ago with uh, air travel and, and just people running to and fro all over the place. Like, you know, because of the technology that we have now in this generation. And so when you see all these things, know that he is near and at, at the very gates. So Jesus is saying here, when you see these things, read Matthew 24, know that he is near, just like you know summer is near from looking at the fig tree. So Jesus expects us to discern and understand the times and the seasons we are living in. Okay. And verse 34 there, he says, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Which generation? Well, he says, uh, when you, verse 33, when you see all these things, know that he's near. This generation, the generation which sees all these things that he talked about in Matthew 24, will not pass away until all these things take place. All right, so we're, we're to recognize the season. Verse 35 continues here. I'm reading in uh, Matthew 24. Verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So we don't know the day, we don't know the hour right now at this point. But he does expect us to discern the season that we are in. Okay, there is a difference there. As were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. So there will be people who are unaware that Jesus is about to return and he will return. But now who is he talking to there? Let's continue. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day 
your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Okay, so maybe the hour. I mean, who who expected that we would be in lockdown right now? you know, uh, one month ago now, or a month and a half ago, a month ago, you know, would you have expected that you would, okay, for those of us in South Africa right now, we're on lockdown and uh, we are, it's illegal to leave the house <clears throat> unless you are going to the shop to buy food or, you know, emergency or, or something like that. So <clears throat> who would have expected that? A month and a half ago, business as usual, people, you know, whatever. But now here we are. It all happened very quickly and we find ourselves in lockdown right now. So it was an hour that we didn't expect, but it happened very quickly. So it says the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So things can unfold very quickly and we can find ourselves in that situation. But he says we need to understand the season. He talked about recognizing the season. And when you begin to see certain things, then you know, hey. And then he says, uh, you know, in, so again, I'm reading in Matthew 24, verse 42. So he says, stay awake. Kind of like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he told his disciples, watch and pray. There was a role that he wanted them to play there. Okay, but stay awake. You do not know on what day your Lord is coming. So he, he says, stay awake. Remember the the parable of the the, uh, the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish, and five had oil in their lamp, the wise, and five did not. And the ones that were wise were watching for the bridegroom. They were watching. They were attentive to what was going on so that they could be ready. And they were living, you know, from that place of readiness. So they weren't hiding in a cave, but they were living in this place of readiness. Okay. So if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, what part of the night? So again, we're talking like about a season. Then he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. So the enemy wants to break into our lives and make us think uh, certain ways and maybe make us lackadaisical in the sense of uh, people have always been talking about the time of the end. And, you know, it's just, yeah, you know. It's no big uh, things will always basically continue as they always have. That's what the enemy is trying to break into our house, the, the, our paradigm, our way of thinking to make us think that way. That, you know, uh, it hasn't happened till now. It's kind of like somewhere where we just don't think about it. But we are supposed to stay awake. We are supposed to discern the season. That's what Jesus said. So because he says... He's coming at an hour you don't expect. When, he start, when things start to unfold, they will unfold very quickly, unexpectedly. But then, because we're recognizing the season, we know what's going on. All right. <clears throat> so, he goes on in uh, verse 45, Matthew 24, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? In other words... Those who are teaching the word of God need to especially be discerning of the times and the seasons to give people what they need at the right time in due season. Now, remember, this is the whole context of the return of Jesus, the end times and all of that. And so then he goes on and says, look, as teachers of the word and even as believers, as, as uh, Christians, being able to inform other people what's going on, we need to receive our um understanding in due season. So we need to be discerning the signs of the times and we need to be uh, then giving people what they need during those times because times are changing, new seasons are coming. And so we need to discern that so that we can share from that new paradigm what God is saying. Blessed is that servant whom his master when he comes will find so doing. Truly, I say to you, he will make him ruler over all his goods. So God 
is positioning, has positioned his people strategically throughout the world and wherever you are, you were born in, in for such a time as this and in, in the place where you were born and you are where you are because God wants to use you in that place. And blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. So if we want to be blessed, we need to discern the signs and the seasons and be sharing what God is saying in that time and season. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, like, ah, you know, I've heard this before, nothing ever changes, whatever. Um, so the master of that servant, okay, let me just say this, you know, it's... Um, if you, a lot of movies and that have come out of Hollywood and all of this stuff, they portray people who talk about end times as that really freaky dude on the street corner yelling at people, right? You know, the, it, isn't that how generally whenever, if, I don't know if you can think of movies where they've portrayed people talking about the end times and, but that's generally how Hollywood, that's how the enemy wants to condition people to kind of inoculate them against listening to anything, you know, Bible prophecy, end times, oh, that's a bunch of for fanatics and, and all of that kind of thing. The way that the enemy works, um, you know, the word conspiracy theory, okay, you've heard that, that term before, was invented uh, at governmental levels to condition people against uh, a particular narrative that the government wanted to portray. So they invented the term conspiracy theory and they used that in connection with the issue at the time uh, to say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. And, you know, so they, they were able to attach a label to something that they wanted to change people's way of thinking about. And so now we have this convenient term called conspiracy theory that, you know, um, high levels can throw that terminology and connect it to a particular issue. And then all of a sudden people don't take it seriously because, or, or they'll make a movie about it, you know, it'll make a movie and they'll put an element like some freaky dude on the corner yelling at people talking about Bible prophecy and, and time. And so there's a conditioning that has taken place whereby um, the enemy is through his infiltrating, you know, movies, music, whatever, you know, all kinds of high level governmental, just just everything. He wants to condition people. So he will inject a bit of uh, truth, but then put a spin that it's like connecting it to a, a crazy conspiracy theory or some fanatic yelling on the street. And so then when people do come across somebody talking about Bible prophecy and end times and all that, they, the, the, the mental conditioning that has taken place will immediately associate it with that. Oh, yeah, here you go. Here, here we go. You know, something like that. So little parentheses. So get out of that parentheses there. Because, okay, in Revelation 12, really getting ahead of myself now, we, we, we see a dragon casting a flood of water out of his mouth. That is exactly what I'm talking about, that during these times and the times to come even more, and it's already been happening, there is a propaganda wave that is not accurate. It's not from God, but it's a, it has to do with a mental conditioning towards a certain way of thinking that the enemy wants us to have so that we will be accepting of what he wants to do. For example, you know, if, if we read in, in Revelation 13 about this mark of the beast, right, without which uh, nobody will be able to buy or sell at a certain point. Now, not everybody's ready to receive some sort of uh, microchip and injection in their body in their right hand or forehead as the scripture says and so there's there's a uh, you know there there is a flood of preparation and I want to say propaganda uh, you know but that is the flood in Revelation 12 that is being depicted coming out of the dragon's mouth with the intention it says is to get the bride uh, the believers in and wash them away into a place of of um, where people would perceive them as being untrustable or fanatics or against what is the, the, the good for all, you know? For example, uh, technology, a cashless society, you know, 
they will say solves problems of crime and it solves problems of, you know, nobody's going to steal your wallet. Now there's no cash and and it will all be um, no more corruption. Right. Doesn't that sound good? So because everything will be above board and monitored, uh, every transaction, no cash under the table and all of this. So there's a lot of seemingly positive things that can be said about, you know, that type of thing. And so there will be these waves of explanations and why it's good, uh, you know, and all of that. But we need to understand there's specific narratives. Look, if if God exists and the devil exists, they're not saying the same thing and they don't have the same goals for us. So God's, on one hand, God is saying, this is what's going on and this is how you need to respond to it. On the other hand, the devil is is putting a different spin on what's going on, and he wants us to respond in a different way to accept what he wants to do. But for that to happen, he needs to spin his narrative, and which comes out through media, it comes out through movies, it comes out through various ways. So we need to be discerning of what source we're getting the information from, and that's why we need to come back to the, the Bible, the Word of God as our source for truth, and decisions that we need to make. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's see. We were in Matthew 24, um, verse, we were talking about who is the wise servant giving uh, the people what they need in due season. All right, so, but if a person begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards, in other words, ugh, you know, what do you mean end times? All this, just everything is as it always is and eat, drink, uh, be merry, whatever. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him at an hour that he is not aware. So the master of that servant, which servant? The servant which is beginning to beat his fellow servants, eat and drink with the drunkards. They're not discerning the times and the seasons. They're not with oil in their lamp ready to meet the bridegroom. So they're just like poo-pooing the whole thing. You know, the narrative of end times and Bible prophecy and all of that. It says the master of that servant, verse 50, Matthew 24, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two. Ooh and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this cut in two, the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit. Some people are living out of their soul. They say, Lord, Lord, but they do not know in personal relationship. God. They do not have a desire to please him. They're just building their own little kingdoms and things. So the word of God divides soul and spirit, people's soulish intentions, uh, their own stuff, as opposed to the spirit of God and living for the spirit of God. So the Lord will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. All right, let's go Let's talk about a thief in the night, because in this, when we talk about these things, uh, you know, a big topic is, will we be able to know when he's coming? Maybe he's going to come right now. Maybe he's going to come tomorrow morning. Well, the Bible shares with us certain things that will precede his coming. And the Apostle Paul here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 uh, is talking about some of these things. So let's look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So he is coming as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Now think about labor labor pains. They, they start off at a certain rate, but then the frequency and intensity peaks, and that's when the birth comes, right? So that's the context he's talking about. As things gain momentum and intensity, we know we're getting closer. But you, brethren, okay, here we go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. All right, 
See, now a lot of people have never seemingly read that scripture. <laughs> uh, most people uh, who, who talk about Jesus coming as a thief in the night are saying that we cannot know, you know, more or less, you know, the season in which he's coming and all of this. But here, the Apostle Paul is saying, you are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So Jesus expects us to walk in faith, in love, salvation, you know, so we need our armor on. We need to be watching, praying. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain, obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or we sleep, we should live together with him. So now this is pretty clear. I, I'm not sure I really need to say anything about it, but I'll just highlight what we just read. The Lord is coming as a thief in the night for those who are not watching and expecting his coming. Like the, uh, you know, the 10 virgins. Now they were all, didn't know the day, they didn't know the hour, but the wise virgins were uh, aware of the, the season. They were attentive, they were watching. And so they were ready when he came and then they identified, okay, he's, and they're ready. So now here in First Thessalonians 5, it says, you are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So those who are sleeping, those who are not, uh, you know, studying to show themselves approved unto God, or, you know, we, we need to make sure that we're digging in the words so we can be aware of what's going on, so that we can give meat in due season to those in need. We can share truth with those who, 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 uh, with, with those around us. And so we are not of the darkness. So we are, um, so it says he will, it will not be like a thief in the night for us but for most of the world it will be, okay? So that was 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4. You can write that one down. It'll come up in whenever you discuss um, Bible prophecy and end times and, and things like that. All right, so the, the, that last verse, verse 10, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 10, <clears throat> whether we, <clears throat> excuse me, whether we wake or sleep, sleep is referring to physically dying, we should live together with him. That's one thing to remember, you know, in all of this. Even if we don't under, look, if you love Jesus and he's your heart's desire and you trust him, Psalm 91, we've talked about that, you know, the last period of time where he's our refuge, he's our fortress, and he's our, like our force field, he, he will provide and Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me through green pastures. So it's like, it doesn't, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So it doesn't really matter what happens. God is with us. You know, even if we, we, we die and go uh, be with him at a certain point, praise God. I mean, you know, it's like this world is not our, our final abode here in the sense of the way it is now. Heaven is our abode and, and um, actually the heaven will, will come down here, but it's like our, our, our inheritance is God himself. And so we don't need to worry. We don't need to fear about anything. All of this, all of this is to inform us like, hey, a famine is coming. Are you going to prepare? And so not only for yourself, but you can help others prepare. So there are things that we need to consider. And that's what we're talking about in terms of Bible prophecy is, is we're, we're, we're taking in what he's, what God is telling us is coming so we can be prepared and we can take action accordingly, spiritually, physically, whatever the case may be. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, our, our inheritance is God himself. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is where we want to be. That is the secret place. And so, you know, all right. So now I want to talk about uh, two signs that is spoken of by Daniel that clearly pinpoint we're living in the time of the end. All right. Now I'm going to go to Daniel chapter 12 and read verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words, not shut up, just <laughs> seal. <laughs> Daniel, shut up. No. But you, Daniel, <laughs> shut up the words 
and seal the book. Okay, Daniel was just getting a bunch of revelation from God about prophecy about things that are going on and and we'll look at some of those not not this morning but we're gonna there's so much uh deeper and things we're gonna look at um you know next sunday for sure i don't know maybe during the week uh, like or follow the, the facebook page so you can be informed if we if we do that but for sure on sunday we'll, we'll continue this topic next sunday as well um so shut up and <laughs> the words and seal the book until the time of the end. So all the prophecies and things that God revealed to Daniel referring to the end time, God is now saying, okay, shut them up and seal the book until the time of the end. And many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. So those are two things that God identified with the times of the end running to and fro, and knowledge being increased. Daniel 12, verse 4. Now, the technological advances in, in one generation, the generation which we're living in now, has enabled both of those things to come to pass, which was not happening in previous generations. So, for example, air travel, airplanes. I mean, we have cars as well, but airplanes will take you around the globe I mean, the world is, is our oyster now. We can travel here, there, uh, everywhere, and people are running to and fro with a smartphone in their pocket and a smart watch on their wrist, and it beeps at them, and it says, hurry up, you're going to be late, and somebody calls you wherever you are, and it's like sometimes you just maybe want to unplug just to see what it was like in the old and the good old days, you know, when People were not running, running, literally running to and fro. I'm late, I'm late. The technology follows us. You can work from home almost anywhere now as long as you have an internet connection, another technological marvel of these days, this generation. Um, I mean, it's amazing. I was When I was a teenager, the internet was not in its current form, and but I was into technology. I, was, I, I used to run a... a what they call a BBS, a little bulletin board system on my computer, but it was linked to the, the normal little phone plug and people had to call with the normal phone, the landline phone, and connect to the computer. And then <laughs> at 300 baud, the letters would appear across the screen like, you know, very slow kind of thing. And that was just so cool because that was technology of the time. But now the internet, the world is connected and in such a way that... Um, <clears throat> People are running to and fro, and knowledge is increasing dramatically. Um, so, I mean, knowledge increasing. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, there was a book written in 1982 called *The Critical Path* by R. Buckminster Fuller. He was a futurist and inventor, and he estimated that up until 1900, human knowledge doubled approximately every century until 1900. So human knowledge would double every 100 years, okay, up until the 1900s. By 1945, it was doubling every 25 years from 100 years before 1900s to doubling every 25 years in 1945. And by 1982, it was doubling every 12 to 13 months. IBM estimates, now this article was written uh, a while ago, but IBM estimates that in 2020, human knowledge will be doubling every 12 hours. So from 100 years, knowledge doubling to 12 hours, knowledge doubling. That's a huge difference. So in the coming knowledge tsunami, Mark Rosenberg showed this in a diagram. I'm going to see if I can get it on the screen here. So give me, all right, so you see that little, uh, <laughs> that little diagram that shows in the 1900s, it starts off flat there, knowledge doubling every century, and then 1945, knowledge doubling every 25 years, and then 1982, knowledge doubling every 12 to 13 months, and then 2020, knowledge Okay, this was a prediction by IBM. I couldn't actually find statistics last night about what it's actually, but but it's something like this. It's skyrocketing 
IBM predicts knowledge doubling every 11 to 12 hours. Now, all of this is due to the technology that we have in this generation, the internet and all of the technology, the computers and, and, and all of these things. And so it is very telling that God chose those two things to describe the time of the ends. People running to and fro and knowledge increasing, both are linked to the technological advances that, that we have available in this generation, which was not available in previous generations. And so that is a telltale sign just right there to identify by definition the time of the end. Daniel 12, verse 4. All right. So now this, you know, this technology, of course, it's, it's, there's good and, and bad things that, that come out of it. Like a surgeon's knife can be used. A uh, doctor uses it for good. A, a thief can use a knife for evil. So technology in good hands brings benefits. And, but technology in the hands of an antichrist that the Bible describes, who will set up a, a one world government that the Bible also talks about, we'll look at that. And, you know, again, you know, all of these things, we need to make sure that we're thinking biblically, not Hollywood, freaky, freakazoids, but it's like God is informing us of what's going on. And to see things begin to, uh, the season in which we live in, to say, hey, the leaves are budding. Summer is near. Jesus said we need to discern these times. Okay, so but technology in good hands benefit, but in evil hands, uh, not so much, and it will be used for uh, oppression. So now for, think about the Tower of Babel, Tower of Babel. Back in the Old Testament, there was a time when the world was united um, in evil, <laughs> and it says people's hearts were intent on evil. There was untold suffering going on, and but. And, but they had a common language, humans, uh, the, the people had a common language and there were these, uh, do I get into that? Um, there were things going on at that time, which injected humanity with evil and, uh, which is why the flood came soon after and God had to reboot things going on. But this tower of Babel, they were, they were using it. Um, and, uh, there was a common language and, and, and all of this, but so evil was flourishing because there was this, um, the world was together, but evil was in control. And so things were degrading very quickly. And so it's like when the world is connecting both evil and good come out of it, you know, good, there can be technological advances that, that are helpful to, to people and breakthroughs, medical breakthroughs and all these types of things. But then you also have the other side of the coin if you get uh, um, world leaders who, for, who are with an agenda, then that control can be used for other purposes. So the Bible does talk about this Antichrist and he talks about this one world government which will be uh, put in a position of control to the degree that you can't buy or sell without his mark. And, and so there is this but to get to that point, people are going to need to um, receive more conditioning <laughs> to be able to, to receive that there. And, and it's happening. I have a video clip not ready or I'd show it to you where, you know, people are getting these things in localized situations, little chips to buy from the vending machine and their company that they work. And <clears throat> so there is this um, change of mindset, which is being pushed and going on. But so the world is getting smaller through the technology, the air travel, the internet and people running to and fro and knowledge increasing. And so with that comes the platform and the technology for the Antichrist spoken of to be able to enact his, uh, his, the type of control that he wants to have. And so these are signs, these are seasons that Jesus told us to be aware of. <clears throat> and, um, it says, because of lawlessness, it will be increased. The love of many will grow cold. Matthew 24, 12. So more and more today we see, you know, a sense of lawlessness in the sense of, ah, there is no God and, and faith in God, you know, is, is for those religious fanatics who don't want to bring us into the new world order and they're against the system and all this stuff. And so lawlessness, this sense of, 
I don't need a moral code. I am my own God, you know, like uh, the enemy, like Satan told Adam, uh, Eve in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say that? Oh, he knows you'll just be like him. You, in other words, you don't need to believe what God says. You can hash it out for yourself and be your own God. And so the sense of lawlessness, you don't need God's law written on your heart. You don't need to follow his ways. You can follow your own ways. It's that sense of lawlessness because lawlessness will be increased. And that translates into sin and destruction and things happening in the physical. Because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. And God is love. We looked at that uh, last Sunday, whatever. So, so the people will be growing cold in their relationship toward God. We have people running to and fro, uh, knowledge increasing at you know unprecedented rates. And it's like the labor pains. It started off, remember 1900s, flat, but then whoop, 2020 like this. So the labor pains starting off and then the intensity and the frequency has just skyrocketed now in our times. So we're, we're gonna, I'm going to be wrapping it up here. But um, again, God is shaking whatever can be shaking. So we, we will look at other uh, parts of Matthew 24. And again, this was just a foundational look at um, to, to get us biblically understanding that we are living in the time of the ends. There is a, there is a foundational there's scriptures to understand that help us understand that. And we'll look at more of that next time, next Sunday, 9.30 again on the Facebook Live. But uh, I will just read the first few chapters of Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 1 through 3. Jesus went out <clears throat> and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? So, so the disciples are pretty impressed. Wow, you know, just the temple, it's a very impressive structure and the, the, the way it was built and it's just impressive. Okay. And Jesus said to them, do you see all these things referring to the temple and the physical structures? Truly, I say to you, not one stone <clears throat> will be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Okay, and so that was fulfilled in, in around 70 AD when the Romans came and they, they uh, tore down the temple and they burned it block by block to get the gold out, right? <clears throat> now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? Okay, what he just said about the, the um, temple being torn down. And... What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So now you have a little division here. You have, okay, when is this going to happen? You talked about the destruction of the temple. And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So there is no need to link these together here, right? So we, we have the 70 AD where the temple was torn down, but Jesus has not returned yet, and there are still prophecies that need to be fulfilled in relation to all these, these things that are coming, which we're going through now. So, and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? But now what I wanted to say is that, um, okay, let me read Hebrews 12, then I'll comment. Hebrews 12, verse 26 through 29. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens. This phrase yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Okay, so what we have right now going on is a removal of things that can be removed. Man-made things or physical things or, or whatever can be shaken, they can be moved, they can be um, blocked from participating, don't go there or tear it down or put a stop to it, um, which like is what happened even with the physical Jewish temple at the time. Jesus said, you know, it, it wouldn't last forever there. And so now we have in Hebrews 12, God saying he's going to shake not only the earth, but the heavens and remove the things that can be removed. God, if you feel in your life a bit of a shaking going on, well, God is shaking everybody and everything. Um, and the scripture talks about 
in in Revelation, um, a whole book dedicated to. We'll definitely go there as well. There's there's a certain scriptures that talk about God measuring the temple in the sense of He is seeing. God also has a seal. Okay, we we talk about the mark of the beast in Revelation. It talks about God also seals His bride, His people. And so there is a, a measuring process going on. There is a shaking because God wants us to be part of his bride. He wants us to, to walk with him in that way with oil in our lamps. He wants us to be ready. He wants us to know what's going on, to give people their, their food in due season. And he wants us to be busy about our father's um, great commission and reaching people and, and informing uh, what's going on as well. And so um, God is busy using this time to shake. Now, don't misunderstand me. God did not send the, the virus and, and all of this stuff that's of man-made origin and agenda. But, you know, God is also using this time to, as, a, as a shaking to shake things out of our life that maybe don't need to be there, that maybe are distracting or that maybe, or at least to relegate certain things to a position of lesser importance than they had been in our life so that we can make more space for things of greater importance, things of our Father's kingdom and the mission that he has for us. And 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 maybe it it's learning more, digging into his word, to study, to show ourselves to approved unto God by understanding the scripture more and spending just more time in communion with, with our heavenly father and maybe less with the things of this world and more with the things of our heavenly father. And as we commune more with the things of our heavenly father, then his revelation and his wisdom is opened up to us and we begin to discern the signs of the times and we begin to see the pieces of the puzzle and how they fit together from God's perspective. And so God is busy shaking the world right now. He, If people will allow him by his Holy Spirit, he, he comes in and he shakes and people identify things that are temporal and earthen in nature and, you know, put that relegating that to its proper place, which is uh, underneath the eternal things of the Spirit of God. Now, everything is important, but there's a priority. If, you, if we don't get our priorities right, then things fall apart. If God is our top priority in our heart, and he's our foundation for our life, then all the other things that we do uh, will be established in the proper way. Seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6. Seek first verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. So sometimes we want to put the cart before the horse because we get, we start thinking in the flesh and of a, putting more priority on temporal things. When God is busy saying, look, uh, you know, I'll take care of those things, but establish the foundation, seek first my face, seek first my kingdom, and then all these other things will fall into place. All these other things will be added unto you. Then, you know, faith that works by love, you know, will be strongly activated because we'll be hearing God's inner persuasion speaking to our heart. This is the way, do this, walk ye in it, turn left, turn right. You know, faith will begin to walk by faith and not by sight, what we're observing in the world and the waves like Peter walking on the water, you know, began to view his circumstances and then he, he sunk because he took his eyes off of Jesus. So we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's, you know, and I'm not saying, oh, please, you know, you're going to die tomorrow. But these are the beginning of the birth labor pains that Jesus spoke of. I believe that we are experiencing the beginnings of of these labor pains. So there is, there are things happening in the world and it's causing, you know, the enemy is using it to set up his plans and purposes. But now God on the other side wants to use this to help us to evaluate our life and, and where we're at and, and become more in alignment with his purposes and aware of what's going on. So things are shaking, things are happening. Uh, let me just finish up that in Hebrews 12 there. Um, Verse 28, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence 
and awe. So our God's heavenly kingdom cannot be shaken. Doesn't matter what happens in this world. You know, the 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 impressive temples may crumble down. The they may shut the doors on physical meeting places. At, at look, Jesus said, "Let us work while it is day." He said, I must work while it is day because the night is coming when no one can work. How, how are you going to work? I mean, nobody can work right now. We're on lockdown right now, but you know. So the thing is that we must take advantage of this time. We, we're in a dispensation of grace right now to be able to reach out and do things for our Father's kingdom and to do certain things. And, and we need to take advantage of this time. Make hay while the sun shines, right? Because the night is coming when certain things will not be allowed or done. But those who know their God will be strong and rise up and do great exploits, the scripture says. So let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So the one thing that cannot be shaken is whatever is founded on the word of God, whatever is of God and his kingdom established in our life and, and we're living for that, then um, that will not be shaken. In fact, in Corinthians, it talks about a, a type of judgment, not to see whether you're going to hell or, or not, but it's where our works will be tried and every work which was founded on Jesus and God's kingdom, it will follow us into eternity and all the other stuff will be burnt up, yet we will be saved, it says, yet as by the fire. So the works will be tried and whatever endures the fire comes like gold, as pure gold will come through the fire. Uh, those will follow us into eternity. The rest is 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 temporal. So again, we need to do certain things in this world, and but just let's make sure that the foundation of what's really important, Jesus Christ and uh, our Heavenly Father established as the King of our heart and our life, seeking first His kingdom is what is going to be eternal. It is a wise investor who invests in things that will last, not that will disappear tomorrow, right? You can use things that will disappear tomorrow, but but make sure you put all your stock in, in eternity and what's going to last forever. That's wisdom, isn't it? Isn't that just common sense? So we're receiving a kingdom, the kingdom of God that cannot be shaken. So let us establish our life on that kingdom which cannot be shaken. So when the world shakes, we will not be shaken. Yeah, the physical structures around us may shake and fall, but the kingdom of God established in our hearts and in our lives and our peace it's not going to shake us because God is our refuge in our fortress. He is the rock on whom we build our life and we receive the kingdom that cannot be shaken. So that is the, the inheritance of the children of God. We're not to be a leaf blown in the wind and shaken. We're to, to know our God, to be strong and rise up and do exactly what the Lord is leading us to do in this time. All right, so next time we're going to talk about, if you, we're going to finish up now. So if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free, related to the topic <laughs> at hand, um, about things we've talked about. I mean, there's a lot to talk about, you know, uh, which I will cover in future uh, live streams like this next Sunday, 930, also on the Life Mission Ministries Facebook page. Press like or follow there so you can be informed and reminded if we do other live streams during the week as well. Or, um, or I may post some to my personal Facebook page as well. Um, so... Um, what was I saying now? <laughs> Bloop. Okay, I, I, I finished the little parentheses, but now I, I lost. Okay, so in the future live streams, we will talk, we will go deeper into other prophecies and other things. This is just scratching the surface. This is just to kind of, you know, show us that we are living in the time of the ends and, and to talk about the relevance of this topic. But there is, there is, uh, there is a lot of, we've actually done a whole course through the whole book of Revelation and different chapters in Daniel and, and, and different things. So we will, there's a lot to look at and we will continue this next time. Um, so, but, oh, if you have any questions about what we've talked about, feel free to put in the comments and I'll take a look just now and we can, I'll see if I need to clarify something based on your question or, or something like that. So let's see. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that's about it. So again, let's remember God is with us. We're his kids. He loves us so much. We need not be afraid. Our kingdom will not be, his kingdom will not be shaken. Let's make sure his kingdom in our heart. And, you know, there's absolutely nothing to fear, but it becomes more and more important to be led by the Spirit of God. 
All right, so let me see if there's any comments here. Let's see. Hi, Eduardo. Hi, Mark. Greetings from Melbourne. Greetings to you as well. Hey, Frankie. Olaf the Snowman. Not sure when she get there. Hi, Craig from Scotland. Hello there. Welcome. Hi, Quentin. All right, so... Please, if there's any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I will say goodbye for now until our next session. All right, well, um, if your comment pops up, hi, Gerald, good to see you as well. You, you are welcome to type your, um, uh, your questions in the comments and I'll try to interact there as well and, and we can talk about things there as well. And other than that, God bless you. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is with us always. And it's so good to, be, to, to know him. All right, God bless you. Much love to you and yours. Have some quality time with your family. Have some quality time with God. Have some quality time with God and your family. Or if you, you're by yourself there, quality time. Father, Son, Holy Spirit with you. What a amazing... Um, quality time you can have as well. So much love. See you next time. God bless.